this job. So we'll have a pre-drill type of thing, we'll see where you're at, which or you've done so far at home. Then we'll talk about it on the PowerPoints, and then you guys go do your own work, and then we're gonna do a post sort of drill exercise. And hopefully that'll create some study sessions around the whole thing. Um, and I'll make videos with that. Good. So at the beginning then, what I want you to do, I want you to take a sheet of paper out, and I want you to be writing down as many terms as you remember that I point to there. And I'm using the skulls, when we get to test two, which is the practical test sort of of the class, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing at structures and I'm asking you to write down what it is. And it's on the computer, but it's the same kind of thing. It's these models I use, it's just pictures and videos. So what I want you to do first, give me as a term and write it down, don't say it. I want you to tell me the bone that makes up the front of the head here. What is that bone called that makes up the front of the head? And you write it down somewhere, take some notes. It doesn't give you any, cost any points or anything. It's just a drill exercise. And then um, we'll go through it. So the first is that front part here. And then the second bone, when I talk about this second test, I talk about bones. And then I talk about landmarks on bones, which are smaller parts than the bone itself. So the second one, we can do a landmark. There's a landmark between the eyebrows right in here. What is that landmark called? And you find all these terms on the list. So these are all the terms on the list. So the part between the eyebrows, what is that landmark called? So that was number two. I know, go right into it. And then number three, I'm turning the head around and I'm looking at the back of the head and I want you to tell me what is that bone called? The back of the head bone. Or the bone at the back of the head. The whole bone. And again, it's on the list. That's number three. And then number four, I want you to tell me the bone that makes up the lower jaw. The lower jaw bone. What is that called? Number four. Oh, you're welcome. The lower jawbone, what is that called? That was number four. That's good for that. And I will go to a few muscles in the face. That was the second chapter, we'll do number five. I want you to tell me a muscle that is a circular muscle that goes around the eye. A muscle that is around the eye. It's a circular muscle. And the circular part is in the name. As in a, an orb, a world. A round structure. So that's number five. These muscles are interesting, they have really weird names. I know it's a little scary at first, but it's kind of, you don't have to memorize them. It's, it kind of helps the understanding of the name of the muscle. The second muscle I want you to tell me is a muscle that goes up and down on the side of the jaw. It's a chewing muscle, it goes up and down on the side of the jaw. It's a big chewing muscle, it's number six. Half the list 10. If you watch the video, half the list 10. You how you do that. These are all terms on the list. And then number seven, I'm going to look at the muscle that is on the corner of the mouth going downward. From the corner of the mouth going down, pulling the corner of the mouth downward like a frowning. Like when we are depressed. So look at that list. Corner of the mouth going down. What number was that? Number seven. A 
And then number eight, last one for here, this one has a harder one, the name is very interesting. It goes from the corner of the mouth to the cheekbone and helps us in smiling. It goes from the corner of the mouth to the cheekbone and helps us in smiling. That's number eight. All right, what was the first term? Anybody? Now, so speak it out if you have it. Don't worry if it's wrong. Frontal. frontal bone. Frontal bone, good. Number one was the frontal bone. Number two is the landmark on the frontal bone. What was that? The glabella, yes. That's right next to the superciliary arches. The glabella is in the middle. It means hairless, so that's between the eyebrows. And then we turn it around. What's the back of the head bone? Occipital bone, perfect. And then lastly on the bone, we did the lower jaw bone. What was that called? Mandible. Mandible, very good, very good. And then we went to the muscles of the face. We got the circular muscles around the eye. What was that called? Orbicularis oculi. Orbicularis oculi, very good. Then we also, what did I do? The one on the side here goes up and down. Did I say that? That was the last one. This one is the, the chewing muscle. The, huh? the masseter. The ramus is part of the bone, which is right there. That's the part of the bone where then the masseter attaches to. And the masseter is the muscle. Very good. And then I think I went to the one that is the corner of the mouth going down. Almost, depressor, anguli oris. So angle is the corner of the mouth, that's an angle. The lip is the labi. So the anguli is the one in the corner of the mouth here, the labi will be the one next to it. Very tricky, but that's where the words come in. All right, perfect. And then the last one is the smiling muscle. So now we're going with that. What did you say before? Zygomatic. That's the one. This is the zygomatic is right in here. Perfect. So that was number eight. Good. Not so bad, huh? So what I want to do now is I want to go through the terms on um, the pictures. And I want to make sure you guys understand what we're really talking about. So make sure you ask questions. So when you go down the list, the first bone that we have is the frontal bone. And so the frontal bone is... The one that's right here in the front of the head. So that's um, pretty, hopefully, fairly self-explanatory in the name. Um, on the frontal bone, the terms that we need to know are underneath it. And they are the superciliary arches that I want you to know. So those are the eyebrows. And then in between there is the glabella. And that's the second term, that's the landmark that I want you to know. So the superciliary arches are the eyebrows. And in between the eyebrows is the glabella. And that's that hairless part. Then the second bone that we are going through is the parietal bone. And we got two of those. Actually, let me introduce you to this skull too, since they put that out for us. We have the frontal bone is in red, and then the parietal bone is in sort of yellow on the side. So this is the side of the head, kind of above the ear. All right, so that's the parietal bone. And the parietal bone, what I want you to know or point to is the sagittal suture. And the sutures are these jagged lines between the bones. And the sagittal suture is the one that goes up and down in the sagittal plane, which in chapter one, we talked briefly about those planes. That sagittal plane separates the body to right and to left. And so that's this um, suture here. So that's a landmark that I want you to know for the parietal bone. When we go then further back, we go to the back of the head, that's the occipital bone. Oh, see, here are the sutures. Things to hold. That's that sagittal suture going up and down right there. And then we go to the occipital bone, and that's the one in the back. That's the green bone right here on our list. It's the next one. And when you look at the occipital bone, a couple of landmarks, the biggest one is that big hole down in here. That's part of the occipital bone. 
And that hole is the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum. That's that big hole in here. Right here. The other parts that I want you to know are, um, where are we? The occipital condyles, and they are right next to the foramen magnum. So here's the hole, and then the condyles are right next to them. So you look at the hole, you have these two surfaces that are sort of smooth and all rounded. Those are those occipital condyles. The term condyle means it's a, it creates a joint. When you see condyle, you're thinking joint. When you think joint, you think bone to bone connection. These are where the spine starts. So C1, when we look at the skeleton, you see this occipital condyles right here, and then C1 is that first vertebra, that round structure, and sits right on that. So that's really where our head sits on the spine, is that occipital condyle, those two of them, one on each side. So that's kind of a cool structure to know. And then the last one, um, here is the external occipital protuberance. You all have a list, right? If you don't, print it, if you're home, print it out or pull it up from the um, test review. Um, the ex external occipital condyle or protuberance, sorry, protuberance is right here. So this looks a little weird. When you look at your own head, it's the big, big bad bump at the back of the head. That's that occipital, external occipital protuberance. On the skull, you can see like right here, that bump, that's that thing, that little roughy thing. And, and when you see a rough thing on a bone, you think muscle attachment. So you got a lot of muscles that go right into this area here, like the trapezius muscle, for example. Uh, and so that's what, what these rough areas are. Okay, see, that's not too bad. Then we get to the temporal bone. And the temporal bone is an interesting bone. That's a bone that's right behind the ear. So the temporal bone is right here where the ear is. And we have a couple of structures there. We have the mastoid process. And when you look at the mastoid, well, actually, let's start with the external acoustic meatus, because that's the hole in the ear. The external acoustic meatus is where the ear canal goes in. So if you stick your finger in your ear, that's what you're sticking your finger in, the external acoustic meatus. And then right behind that, you've got a bump. Right there, you've got a bump. And that bump is the mastoid process. So the bump on your own self, the bump right the ear, and then the bump behind the ear is the mastoid process. So that's that first landmark on the list right there. Oh wait, did I give you the wrong sheet? Did I give you the one I already wrote on? No, I gave that to somebody else. <laughs> no problem. All right, so that's the mastoid process. And then, so here we got that, that, that external acoustic meatus, the mastoid process. And then we have this place where the mandible comes in and joins in. The jawbone joins in. And that place is right here, that indentation in the bone. And that's known as the mandibular fossa. So that's the mandibular fossa. So that's kind of cool the way that the terminology is because this is the mandible and then this is an indentation right here on the temporal bone where the mandible can stop, stick in. And so that's called the fossa. A lot of times a, a place that's a shallow depression is known as a fossa, F-O-S-S-A. -S -S uh, yeah, on the last panel I put up a link that I just typed in landmark names or something, and I got a website. So if you Google Google these landmark names or, or body parts or prefixes and suffixes, you get these lists because grouping names together and understanding general names like condyle or fossa is very important or very helpful because you got a condyle here. Then if you actually go down to the, look at the mandible, look down at the mandible where the mandible is at the list. The first term there, is the first landmark is a mandibular condyle. That thing here is another condyle. And then we got condyles in the knee. So whenever you see condyle, you think joint. So the more like terminology is like, you, it's like a language, you're creating a web and 
things start getting stuck and you're like, oh, this, I remember this somewhere, this term somewhere from something. Or like, you know, break, when we get to brachii, all these muscles are all brachii. We always know it's the arm. Whenever you see brachii, you know it's the arm. So you can group things together. Create your own little vocabulary. All right, but back to the temporal bone. So we have that mandibular fossa where the mandible goes in. And then we got the external acoustic meatus. We already did that. So that's the ear hole. And then you have this little thing down here. You see this thing sticking down? You think it's a mistake. I mean, I think it's a mistake. It looks like it's not supposed to be there. That is a muscle attachment for some of the muscles that raise the bone here, the hyoid bone up and down. And that's known as the styloid process. It's a little bit, you see it over there, it's a little bit lost down in here, styloid process. Styloid uh, means pen, like a stylus. Like all these styluses we write with. Because we got styloid processes in the arm too. So we'll talk about that when you get to the arm. Oh, and now it gets complicated. Now it gets complicated. So the styloid process. But the next one, now we're going to open the skull up. And we see right in here, there is, well, we orient ourselves. That's the back. That's the front. Same like in here, back, front. There's the foramen magnum, the big hole right in here. And a little bit to the side, you've got this raised area. If you feel it, if you open it, you feel there's a raised area in here. And that, yeah, there's other skull back in there on the left. And that raised area is known as the petrous portion. The petrous portion. And you know what's so cool in here? That's where we have the organ of balance that makes us be able to balance or feel when in the airplane feel the acceleration or deceleration or, the, or in the elevator and that's also where we have the hearing apparatus inside inside this bone part so that's the petrous portion is inside good and then the next bone is a really interesting bone let's look at this exploded skull again let me find the bone here there it is let me look at the exploded skull again Let me open it up. Let me open the loop. It's childproof. When we open it up, you see these are the, the temporal bones on the side. This is the occipital down here. But then we got this yellow bone. It goes across the whole thing. See that yellow bone goes across like underneath the eye socket by the nose there. It goes across. And that bone is known as the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone looks like a bat. Sphenoid means bat. It just looks weird. But, you know, all super quadruple dimensional of some kind. And so that bone is really, really important because it's the bone that every other skull bone attaches to. So if you have a concussion, you hit your head on something weird. And you get stuck. What happens is the brain breathe or the skull bones breathe. They move a little bit in and out very gently. So that's cerebrospinal fluid. We talk about that when you get to the brain um, rhythm. And when you get the skull, I'm going to do it afterwards. When you get the skull jammed and you, these don't move anymore, right, then the brain can't breathe properly. And so that's part of the concussion problem. And so. But what we need to, what actually a technique that I've learned is, is what we do is we physically get a little finger cut balloon up the nose all the way underneath the eye socket and pump it up and it pops that bone back and it releases all the tension. Crazy. But that's sort of where you see the anatomy has, understanding some of these concepts gets you really far because, you know, that's a little bit outside of the box thinking, but that's an osteopathic technique that's been around for hundreds of years. Or at least 100 years. Yes, sir. Okay, so then we have from the sphenoid bone, we go to the ethmoid bone. And the ethmoid bone, what do I want you to know about the ethmoid bone? A couple of things. The ethmoid bone is really the bone when you look into, you shave the nose off here, and you look in, it's that bone in the nose in there. It's all of those little things. So if you look in from the front end of your nose, it's pretty much what you see is the inside there is the ethmoid bone. 
So the S by bone is very, very delicate as a structure, um, um, as the nose is. As you get, if you get banged in the nose, you realize it is delicate in there, and it can hurt. Um, what we have in there is olfaction, the breathing apparatus. So the molecules, when we eat, a lot of the, the smell or the taste of food, taste is what we get through the tongue. Smell is what we get through the, eat the nose, the, the breathing apparatus. And so these molecules get aerated with air, and then they get picked up on the roof of the nose by receptors. And then these nerve fibers, they go through the top of the nose into the, into the brain right here. And what we want to know as landmarks are these little things that stick up here. And that thing is the Krista Gali. If you see there on the, on the terminology here, <clears throat> that thing's sticking up right here. So if it's like in there, you can feel it. You open the skull up, you can feel that pump up there. It feels like it's a mistake. It's not quite, you know, it's like just sticking up. That's that thing called the Krista Gali. And it's like a, a, a cox comb. That's what the terminology means. And what you have attached there is actually going to be a big membrane that, that goes in between the brain and separates the brain from left to right. It's going to be called the Falx cerebra, F-A-L-X cerebra. We talked briefly about that in the brain chapter. So if you don't pick that up, don't worry about that. Yes? What orientation is this picture that has the personality? This is from the front. Okay. So you're looking into the nose. So this here, this big long thing, I had it on a list before, it's a perpendicular plate. So if you look into the nose, that's that inside, between the right and the left, left nostril. That's right, that, that bony part that comes down. And these things are so delicate that sometimes people stick their finger into like a real skeleton, they break it. The other term there is the creepiform plate that I also have there. The creepiform plate is around the Krista Galli you can sort of make out there should be a few holes in there. Some of the skulls show a little holes. Some of the skulls are, it's plastic, so it's not as delicate as bone, right? Um, and these little holes are visualized here as we look up towards the eye socket. This is an eye socket, and you look upward, to up the nose where you see these little holes. And they are basically here, right next to the Krista Gali. Here, the fo called creepiform foraminal. As a foraminal is a single hole, a plate is the whole area of the hole. These are the nerves of smelling that enter from the nose into the brain. So the nerves physically travel through these. And nerves. then from there, we go into the facial bones. And we got the upper jaw bone, that's known as the maxilla. And on the maxilla, we basically want to know, we have multiple terms, of course, but the one that I want you to know is the roof of the mouth. It's called the palatine process. So the roof of the mouth, if you stick your tongue on the roof of the mouth, that's a palatine process. If you go all the way to the back, all the way in the back, if you turn your skull upside down, you see in here there's a little bit of a ridge right in here. So all the way in the back of the roof of the mouth is its own bone, and that's known as the palatine bone. Yeah, you see it here. You see the red, the purple bone is the maxilla, and then the green bone is the palatine bone. And then from there, we go into the mandible. We don't do those. There's a mandible. And the mandible is the lower jaw bone. That's the big one. So that's where the, the lower teeth come. The maxilla is where the upper teeth are. And uh, the mandible, the lowers. We already talked about the mandibular conduct. That's the part, part of the mandible that makes a joint with the temporal bone right in here. That's known as the temporal mandibular joint, TMJ. Have you heard of TMJ? Big problem. Why is it a big problem? It's a really complicated joint because we have two of them that need to work at the same time together in harmony. If one of them is messed up, but this one moves more, guess what? That's what it hurt if one don't move right. And then the other thing is you have to glide the joint motion properly, you have thickenings or discs on ligaments in the front and in the back, and if one of them gets stuck on one side and the other, it hurts like hell. And so it's really delicate. So, you know, be careful with that.
If you have issues, I have a lot of results with just massaging the outside muscles and taking a finger, taking a glove and putting my hand, my finger on the patient in between the teeth and the bone and having them, chew, them bite down and then massaging a little bit on the inside what I do on the outside. Because you've got a muscle on the inside and that seems to really help people. And that's not complicated to do if you're really good at, you know, with your, you know a little bit what you're doing, but you're in anatomy now, so you're learning about these things. My goal is that you can all take care of each other with that kind of stuff. Because these kind of pains are really hard, and sometimes it's really hard to get help for this stuff. And it's very often, it's not that complicated. I when we look at the mandible, we got two big pieces. We got the front piece that sort of reaches around this thing I'm holding here. That's the body of the mandible. And then we got the side piece, the bar on the side, and that's known as the ramus of the mandible. So the body and the ramus are the big ones. And then we already talked about the mandibular condyle, and now we have one more thing, and we have this little jagged stuff here, this little thing sticking up in front of the mandibular condyle, and that's known as the coronoid process. And it's kind of annoying, the coronoid process right here, so that thing. If you see something like that, you've got to ask, why the heck would the body do that? And it most likely, muscle attachment. Something sticking up like that, muscles mostly attach from bone to bone to move bones around. So if you've got like a big bump here on the side, that's annoying when you fall on it, it's probably muscle attachment. It's a big bump sticking out somewhere, muscles need to attach someplace to get a, a biomechanical advantage to move the body around. And so this is the same thing. So the coronary process is the, is the place where we have the Temporalis muscle attachment. Sorry, this is the other side. So it's like this. The coronary process is right here. And then the temporalis is a muscle that attaches right here and reaches down into the jaw and closes the jaw that way. So if you clench your teeth, you feel a muscle bulging right in here. Often. That's that muscle. It's called the temporalis muscle. It's on your list on our muscles, by the way. Let's just go right there. List, list on our muscles. You see the last two muscles? One says temporalis, and the other one says masseter. So this is, the, we're going to look at it again in a mo moment, but this is the temporalis muscle right here, and it goes down from, from here above the ear and reaches underneath and attaches into this bump, the coronoid process. And so that's how he closes the mouth from this angle. The other one we're going to have is just attached here at the zygomatic arch or bone, which actually haven't talked about yet. The cheekbone is its own bone in the face. It's called the zygomatic bone. The cheekbone is the zygomatic bone. And that, I need you to know that because we have a zygomatic muscle as we've seen that just in the prequel, reader pre yeah. So the temporalis connects to the coronoid process of the mass mandible and closes the mouth this way, so this angle, and then the masseter attaches from the ramus on the side into the zygomatic bone and closes the end, closes the mandible straight up. So you close the you close the jaw from multiple different angles. See like here this angle and then this angle straight up. So that gives you a strong bite. Well I have a new puppy, his bite is way stronger than mine, I can tell you that. So that's the zygomatic, and then the last bone um, I want you to know is the nasal bone, and that's sort of self-explanatory, if I find it. The nasal bone is the one by the nose, called nasal bone. So you want that on the test. That's the easy one. That's why I left it. So the nasal bone is by the nose. We got these small little ones in here, vomer, lacrimal, we're not going to worry about those in this time around. Anatomy sort of builds on it, you know, there's a lot of building going on. All right, let, so that was the skull. So now let's just go through the muscles of the face. You, you still have a little more giving you? No, are you tired yet? Hello, I need feedback. Otherwise I keep talking all night. One time they had me teach physiology, bio four, in the summer. And where the heck is my stuff? 
And it was a four hour lecture. And it ended up calling me the filibuster because one time a student who worked at Starbucks said, now at Pete's, that one's saying Starbucks, asked if I want a coffee. I said, sure, that would be great. What would you like? I like a large, what is it, large latte. Instead of three shots, she put six in it. She told me later. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, that was your own fault because I was just talking away. So the fa so most of the time, muscles attach from bone to bone. But they move our stuff around. They move us around. Facial muscles are a little bit different. They attach from muscle, I mean, from from skin to skin, and so they make our facial expression. So when I this is the only lecture I really did myself, all from A to Z. Because I was like, how the heck are we going to do these facial muscles? So what I did is I ended up going with, with facial expressions. So that's the lecture. So we can bypass that because you got all of that on. Now this was the funny one. Because when I wrote this, <laughs> when I wrote this, this guy, was in, this guy was in the White House when I made this. It was before Obama, and I said, I can't put the president up there. That's not me. That's too mean. So I thought, I've got to put somebody else up there, too. So I got this picture. But then it turned upside down. And then I was like, oh, my God, he's going to probably sue me. So that's where the state of affairs these days, huh? Um, <laughs> anyway, so when we look at muscles, muscles attached to, to two things. Muscles just contract. That's all muscles do. They shorten. So in an arm, yeah, the muscles attached here and here. If I contract it, boom, makes the elbow go short. So it sh the muscle shortens, it moves the bone. We have multiple muscle attachments. We have, uh, 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 well, two of them. Most of the time it's two of them. We have an origin. We have an insertion. So we have to label. We can't just say muscle attachment. We have to give it specific names because, you know, we're nerdy people. So we have to do that. So the origin is the place where the muscle sort of originates, I visualize myself. Like it's the stable region. Like if a muscle is attached to the shoulder and the elbow, when I contract it, the elbow moves. The shoulder didn't move. The shoulder is the origin, the stable region. The elbow end is where the muscle goes in, inserts into that other part. So that's the second muscle attachment, so the insertion. Then we have an action. Each muscle, when it contracts, it does something. It moves the bone around. So that's the action. When I contract the biceps, break the eye, I'm going to move the elbow. I'm going to bend the elbow. And so that's the action, bending the elbow. Like, and so that's all we need to know. Then every muscle has a nerve innervation. So now we get to the facial muscle. We're going to not attached to bones now, we just attach skin to skin and move um, and move the skin around and make some faces. So on the test, you do not need to know about the action. You do not need to know about the origin insertion. It's good to know because it makes you understand what we're doing. But on the test, all you need to know is when I point to this muscle, you say frontalis muscle, the front of the head muscle. You want that on the test. If you're walking on the wall, front first, you hit your frontalis muscle and your frontal bone and your frontal lobe of the brain when we get to the brain. So you want to learn that word frontal. It's helpful. Yes, secret. So like here's the frontal belly on that one. Is that interchangeable? Like, um... Yeah, so, okay, okay. That's that's a good point. I mean, for us, yeah, it's the same thing. And, it, and the belly means a belly, you know, the main part of a muscle. And so when, when they actually, see they use, they call this muscle epicranius as a collective. And I hate, they always do this though, because when you learn anatomy, it gets confusing. And so you kind of have to learn where the ballparks are. That's why in the booklets or on these pages too, when there is an also known as an AKA, I try to put as many there. So you have cross reference and you know what's what. So as you see here, frontal belly for us, is, it's frontal bone. I mean frontal muscle. And more frontalis, would you say, one of the other words? Yeah, when we use the muscle alone, when they talk about just this muscle, they say frontalis. When they talk about the whole scalp, the epicranius, then they talk about the frontal part of the whole scalp, the whole epicranius, and then they have the, you know, they call it the galea up and erotica. You get neurotic if you learn all of those words. And so we don't. 
And so that's that white stuff. And then the back has its own muscle that we don't talk really, and it's called the occipital muscle, occipitalis, or occipital belly of the epicranium. But so technically, um, we call it the frontalis because we only talk about that muscle itself. If you say frontal, be front, frontal belly on the test, it's a, it's a point, don't worry about it. Because it's really, the, for, us, for us, it's really the same thing. It's really kind of an AKA. Okay. Then the next one that um, I wanted to know, there's the corrugator supercilia. And the corrugator supercilia is the one that's called the frowning muscle. So that's where they put the Botox in. If you have, then you can't frown anymore. Um, so that's the corrugator supercilia. That's right up top of the glabella. So the corrugator supercilia is right on top of the glabella. <clears throat> that muscle. I left it in because I like it. Then we got a couple of muscles that are round. A round muscle is often called an orbicularis muscle. Orb as in the the, the globe, the, the orb, our world orb, the round thing. So orbicularis oculi is around the eye, right here. And the orbicularis oris, which is further down on the list, third from the bottom, and that's the one around the mouth. So the round muscle, the round muscle right here, that's the orbicularis oris. And when we get to the mouth, we can go to the mouth right now and have a whole bunch of them attached. Yeah, let's do that because we just have to jump over the nasalis. And the nasalis muscle is the one on top of the nose. I left that in because that's like, if that's on the test, that better be an easy one. The nasalis is on top of the nose. So by the way, on the test, you have this list with you. It's all open book. I don't want you to do worry about memorizing. I want you to go into the depths as much as you can of studying it and understanding it. Um, okay, so the orbicularis muscle is the one around the mouth. And then we have a bunch of muscles that attach to the mouth. We have a set of muscles that attach to the corner of the mouth. And we have a set of muscles that attach to the lips of the mouth. And so on our list there, after the nasalis, it says levator labi superioris. And a levator labi superioris muscle is right here, grabbing the lip. I can tell you why it's never on the test. It's really hard to find. But it's, so it's never on the test. Because it's right in here, lifting up. Lifting, right in here, this area, lifting up that lip from underneath. All right, so it's a really hard muscle to tap. To tap. First, the other thing about that term you want to know is levator. That means lifting up something. So that, with that, you know it's actually on the top, even though it says it again in here. So, but if you look at the name, and that's part of the anatomy, slow down the thinking. Look at the names. Lifter of the lip, and it's on top. And then we got a second one on top here, and that muscle is the one that goes from the corner of the mouth to the zygomatic bone. Guess what's that? Guess what that one's called? Zygomaticus. So now we have two terms that go with zygomaticus, the cheekbone and the zygomatic or the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone, and the zygomatic muscle. And that's the one that's the smiler muscle. Because it raises the corner of the mouth upward and lifts it up. And so as we have two on the top, we're going to have two on the bottom. We're going to have the depressor, and they're both called depressor. That's kind of easy to remember once you know about it. The depressor anguli oris is the corner of the mouth. The corner also can mean angle, like making an angle. And a corner of the mouth that pulls that down, that's the depressor anguli oris. Pull the corner of the mouth down. And then right next to it is the levator labi inferioris. And that's right, if that's the corner one, you have that as your reference point. The one right next to it, that's the labi. Depressor labi inferioris. And again, you know, depressor, it's, it, we know it goes down. Because all that we got left now 
It's the ones on the side of the mouth. A lot of this is about the mouth, have you noticed? So the, the side of the mouth is two of them. One is deep and one is superficial. The deep one is the dimpler. It's the vaccinator. If you have a, had a baby and you don't do it, it's not your kid. Stick your hand into their mouth. That cheek is so ginormous when they're first born. That muscle is huge. And that muscle basically squeezes, and that's the suckling motion. So the boxinator is also is the suckling muscle that helps the baby um, um, nurse. And it makes a dimple. And then the last one is the little sliver of muscle that's right, that's where that yellow thing is here. That's right on top of the boxinator. And that just pulls the corner of the mouth lateral so that it flattens out the mouth. That's the rhizorius muscle. Rhizorius. All right. And let me point out the temporalis and masseter on the picture. So you can see, this is a pretty good shot where you can see it goes into the coronal process right in here. And the fans, see on this, on this, it's very slim, smell, slim, but sometimes it's much bigger. And so it fans that whole top of the ear area, and it pulls the child close this direction. And then the masseter attaches at the zygomatic bone and goes into the ramus and pulls the child on this, like this direction. So then you have multiple directions. And then we got two more that we don't even study. We got them on the inside. That's what I was saying, put the finger into the mouth between the teeth and the bone. That's the, this muscle. That muscle is on the other side. It's a little hard to see. But if you take the jaw this way, it's on the on inside of the ramus. And it goes upwards to one of those, if you turn the skull upside down, you see these things coming down. It's part of the sphenoid bone, actually. And it goes to these pterygoid plates, they call them. And so you got those three muscles that close the jaw, and then you got one small little muscle that's attached here that opens, that pulls the jaw forward a little bit at the open. So one of the four muscles opens the jaw. But we don't study those that are underneath because they're, you know, it's really hard to find them on the models, and it's also, a, it's, it's kind of a complicated place where it's at. But clinically, I want you to be aware of them because it could be very helpful just to massage them. Good. What's the name of those ones underneath? The pterygoids. See, the amino lateral pterygoids. I have a page on that because they are very important. All right, so what I want to do now, uh, well, first, do you have any questions? Was that, is that helpful to go through them like that? Good, then why about we do a session on the table and you guys go through these terms amongst one another? We'll do, is that the right time? What time is it? Seven. Seven, so that's perfect. So then we do about a half hour, 40 minutes of that. And then we'll finish up when you kind of fried a little, we'll finish up with another drill and go through the terms a little. And then next week we can start with the skull and the facial and bring in the next section. All right, sound all right? Good, let's do that. And if you need a break, just take a break on your own terms. That's, oh yeah, that's how I work. <laughs> I'm not that good at you know, telling you what to do. Next week is the skeleton. And then we have a week on the trunk muscles. And then we have a week on the upper extremity muscles. And then a week on the lower extremity muscles. And smell is really interesting. Okay, so let's finish off with a drill. Let me get my pipe cleaner. You take a sheet of paper, your term list, and write down. So when I do the test, I want three things. I either want a bow. I want a landmark, which is a part of a bone, or I want a muscle. When you look at the skull, the first column, you always have the bone first, like frontal bone, and then underneath, a little tab inward, indented, are the landmarks. The landmarks are the smaller parts. 
Make sure on the test you don't give me the bone when I ask the landmark. I sometimes am feeling nice to give you half a point, but make sure you differentiate that. Um, so when I ask for landmark, give me the smallest piece. So when I ask for this bone, you said the frontal bone. When I ask for this landmark, you say the glabella. See that? Frontal bone, and then the third term down is the glabella. All right, so let's do that. So the, um, what I would like for you to tell me is what, is what are these bones on the side of the skull called? That's number one. What are these two bones on the side of the skull up here? What are they called? Give me the whole bone and write it down. Don't say it, just write it down as number one. Number two, I want you to tell me, when I look at the back of the skull, back here, I don't want the bone, but I want you to tell me the bump at the back of the skull, that landmark. Write down what that landmark is called. The bump at the back of the head. That's number two. The bump at the back of the head. <clears throat> then number three, we go into the side, the bone behind the ear. Complicated bone. We have this hole here. That's number three. That's where the sound waves go in. So that's the ear hole. What behind is that is a bump. And you can feel it on yourself. You've got the ear, and behind the ear is a bump. And you feel that. When you push, it hurts a little bit. Give me the name, number four. Give me the name, the landmark of that bump. What is that bump called? The bump behind the ear. Then when we open the skull up and take the skull plate away, we look on the inside. We have the front here. We have the back here. There's a term I forgot to tell you in the lecture part. Inside here, there is this indentation that has the pituitary gland in. It's on the sphenoid bone. So look on the sphenoid bone. And I want you to tell me, what is that indentation? Oh, that All right, good. So then we get to number six. So when I go to the front of the skull, on the inside still, looking down, right above the nose, there's this little piece of bone that sticks up. Right above the nose. What is that little bone called that sticks up? Right over on top of the nose. So, but then number seven, let's just stay in that thing, make it a little more, stay complicated. Um, there's a big hole. What's the big hole called? Write that down. What's the big hole called? All right, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then let's go a little bit to the lower jawbone. I want you to tell me the part of the lower jawbone that makes the joint with the bone by the ear. What is that part called that makes the joint and sticks into the bone there by the ear, the ear bone? We're going to do some muscles here. Number nine, let, tell me the muscle that's above the ear that reaches down into the mandible and is part of what closes the jaw. It's a mass, muscle of mastication. The muscle that closes the jaw, that's on the bone, that sits behind the ear. And then number 10, we'll go to the muscles around the mouth. When we look at the muscles around the mouth, we got that round one that goes around, that's the orbicularis oris. But then we got two muscles that attach to the top sort of portion, two on the side, and two towards the bottom part. So I want you to tell me the muscle that attaches from the angle of the mouth and reaches upward to the cheekbone. The muscle that attaches at the angle of the mouth that moves upward to the cheekbone. Then number 11, we're going to go again to the angle of the mouth, and now we're going to take the muscle that goes down from the angle of the mouth, reaching down, making a frown. That's number 11. And then let's close out the last one. What's the muscle between the eyebrows that makes you frown, that makes you show anger? <clears throat> the Botox muscle. What's that one? That's number 12. 
All right. Go, ready to solve the quiz? The drill? I'm not calling the quiz anymore, I'm calling the drill. All right, now you just shout out whatever you know, okay? What was number one? Parietal bone. bone. Number two? External occipital protuberance. Very good. Number three? External acoustic meatus, the ear hole. Number four? Mastoid process. Very good. Number five. Oh, wait, I gotta open it. Cella torsica. Very good. Number six. Cristagalli. Excellent. Number seven. For Raymond Magnum. And number eight. Mandibular condyle. Excellent. And then number nine. I can't even keep up with you so fast. Number nine. Temporalis, number 10, Psychomaticus, number 11, Depressor angular oris, and lastly, Corrugator supercilii. Very good. Good job, you guys. Any questions? That clear? See how good you did? You got all of them right. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for coming. So